I'll start this off by saying I grew up completely 100% adamant that the paranormal isn't real. It can all be rationalized and that people who believe in it haven't thought about it hard enough. I've made other posts on other subs about paranormal events that have happened in my life recently that have completely changed my mind, primarily about my neighbor's house. That's not what I'll be talking about today, though. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small, rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest in a camper. I've lived in this county my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to the conclusion that my experience around the rural and wooded parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of it. I've had many encounters actually, none back to back, but they happen frequently. There is a forest slash part in the middle of the town that I've always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousins and I thought getting scared was really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but never lasted long. I've always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago. I got married and I'm settling into life as a husband. I take my large all-black German shepherd, Fenrir, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter it. The first time something weird happened was five years ago. I was walking Fenrir, and the woods to the front and to the right of me were silent. My dog started acting really anxious. He's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank. He looks very intimidating and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods following me and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home and that's the end of the first encounter. I had a few more encounters like that, but last year things really amped up. I was on a walk around 11.30 with Fenrir, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier chi mix. We're walking down the same path, and about three blocks away from the woods, four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street towards us, and they seem terrified. Then I hear what I can only describe as what sounded like a human trying to mimic the sounds of a monkey. I thought it was silly, until recently, when I read that other guy's story who heard the same fucking thing. We laughed it off as some kids playing around. Once we get up to the woods and are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhouette staring us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl, and then like a hissing sound, but it wasn't really high-pitched or anything. Both of our dogs acknowledged this as well. Finn started, and Booger growled a bit. I made a Facebook post on the community's Facebook group, and other people told similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide slash maintenance for rail explorers. I'm working there again this year as well. We start April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used federally, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them that you can use to explore the tracks. It's really cool and really fun. The one I work at is like five minutes from where I live, and it goes through the woods in an inaccessible part of the county unless you float down the river and hike up steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge, and you go over two multi-hundred-foot-length old trail bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground above the forest. The second goes over the river, about six months into the job, and it's full. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving around 9 p.m. That means the last tour for the last two months of the year are in complete darkness. The way the job operates is with six employees, four get on the lead bike and two get on the rear. From the lead bike, we drop off one person at a busy intersection so they can flag traffic, and one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. 
The person at the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies, and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands that we use so the customers can see us and light up safety vests. On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes. Instead of leaving the depot at sunset, we were leaving at dusk. I was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black, aside from the stars providing a little light. My co-workers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to the first cart of four. I chatted with them a bit. I was trying to buy some time and wait for the next customer cart, so there wasn't a massive gap for my co-workers, who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave and I was alone. I was alone for 20 minutes. I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. It was one of the only times we've ever had an issue like that as well. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on above my head, so everyone and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit. I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin moving quickly, but right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer cart coming close, so I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed they had a little boy with them, and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point, but I have to act appropriately even more so because of this boy. I don't want to scare him. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus fucking Christ, and spin around with my flashlight on instinct. Poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer, and they're good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection this isn't like an in-town intersection. It's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He's Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in the cornfield and whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him into the field. He was also without communication for those 20 minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and he could see a lot better than me. Another time, that same co-worker and myself were headed back on the front cart. We were a way ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, I'm a bit afraid of heights, and this bridge has massive gaps between the planks that you could fit through. But after doing it so often, you do get used to it. It was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and making small talk. And all of a sudden, it goes silent. We're a hundred and so feet in the air above the woods. We can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear what sounds like a human mimicking a monkey noise, and we hear growling. He looks at me, completely seriously, and tells me in a stern tone that we needed to get out of there right now. I drive the fuck out of there and he moved states to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there, and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers had at least one story. I'm only sharing mine in this post, otherwise it'd be too long. A few months go by, and it's late fall, around the middle of November. I drive through that park in town a lot when I just want to go for a drive. I had my dog, Fenrir, with me and it's around 2 a.m. I can't sleep, so I'm listening to a Melvin CD and driving leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates, I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear. It's beyond fight or flight. I've never felt that way in my life anywhere else, ever. 
and I feel it every time I'm there. I'm driving through the park, and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Fenrir can still poke his head out, but can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around, because I'm already past the halfway point. Turning around would make me stay in the woods longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns I couldn't see around. I round the last corner, and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid, tall and lanky, not quite human, fucking crawling on its hands and feet. But it was crawling fast, 20 miles per hour type of shit. We don't have bears here. The only animal that size are large humans and deer. That wasn't a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Fenrir saw it too. He doesn't bark at animals, not even at other dogs. He went ballistic. He was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer, and I've raised him from birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Fenrir. I'll never do it again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew by my head so close I could have smacked it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I get into the park, I feel extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only street light in the entire park, and I turn around and face the woods. Fenrir and I stand there, frozen, for like ten minutes. The silence was deafening. Any time I heard anything, I'd jump. Finn was anxious as hell, too. He kept staring into a certain spot in the woods, a ways off. I swear, I saw eyes in there every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. It'll be interesting to see what happens at my job this year. I wanted to add that the county I live in is packed full of abandoned mines, hundreds of them. This is a story that pops back up in my mind from time to time. I've only told it to a few people, but I definitely feel like it deserves its place in here. It's for sure one of the scariest moments I've ever had as a child. Back when I was around 10 years old, my mom finally decided that it was time for her to start lessons for her driver's license. When she began taking lessons, she was struggling a lot. For that reason, my dad decided that he wanted to do some practice with her besides the official driving lessons with her instructor, just to make sure that she'd pass the upcoming test first try. My little brother and I were attending swimming lessons at this nearby university at the time. Behind a forested area near the university lays this huge student parking area surrounded by trees, which turned out to be basically empty every weekend. My dad saw the opportunity to take my mom here to drive around for a bit and brought my little brother and I with them, since we were too young to stay home alone. We brought a football with us. When we arrived at the parking lot later on in the evening, my parents began their practice. My little brother and I quickly got bored though, and we asked if we could go over to this little grass field on the side of the parking lot to play some football. My parents let us, since they'd always be able to keep their eyes on us whilst driving around. After playing for some time, my parents ended up driving around in the other end of the parking lot. They were approximately three to four hundred meters away from my brother and I. Suddenly, this white Toyota pulls into the parking lot. We were playing almost right at the entrance slash exit. The car turns around and stops on my side with the vehicle facing the exit. 
The driver rolls down his windows and presents himself as Thomas. He looked friendly, was good looking and young. I would guess around 30 years old. This is where things started to get weird. On the passenger seat was a woman covering her face with a newspaper. All I could see was long blonde hair and on the back seat was a baby sat in a baby chair. Thomas immediately states that he's from the police and that we have to get in the car immediately as he has to talk to us. My brother actually took two steps towards the vehicle, but I stuck my arm in front of his chest as I was sensing something was off. The woman was still covering her face at this point, not saying a word. Thomas then raised his voice and told us once again to get into the car or else he'd have to come out and get us. My brother and I froze out of fear. Suddenly, the woman put down the newspaper, showed her face, and told us in the most calm motherly voice to just listen to the man. The woman looked young, pretty, and like a person who wouldn't hurt a fly. At this moment, I began screaming as loud as I could. What we hadn't seen at that point was that my dad was already running as fast as he could towards us. He was coming from behind the vehicle, so we didn't see it. My parents didn't have time to drive to us since the road down the parking lot was twisted all the way. When my dad heard my scream, he started yelling as loud as he could. Hey, who the fuck are you? Get the fuck away from my children. As soon as Thomas heard my dad and realized my brother and I weren't alone, he threw his car into gear and took off as fast as he could. He most definitely looked like a person who shot himself when he saw my dad. My dad was furious and told my brother and I to hurry up back to the car. He didn't even think about calling the police at that point. He wanted to beat the guy up himself. That resulted in us driving around for the next hour trying to find him before my dad cooled down and decided that he should probably just call the police. We never found out who these people were, but this episode taught me to never judge a book by its cover. People can be the most friendly looking people in the world and still wish evil upon you or the ones you love. I'm not sure what these people would have done to us. I'm sure about one thing though, they definitely weren't from the police. I live in a small town in North Italy, a valley between our typical old mountains. So just behind my home, lots of hikes start. I've always lived here, and I like the mountains. Plus, I'm trying to get into shape so the terrain is ideal, especially because I'm really familiar with it. So, last summer, I was walking my usual route when I thought I could try to have a short hike before sunset. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Italian ground, but there aren't the big spaces and long distances typical of the US, I imagine. I was with my dog, a well-trained Spitz, good company with good instincts that I trust. He's a working dog more than a pet, despite his size. So we took the path and started making our way up. It was nice and relaxed, but we had to be active and a bit more quick, as we didn't have too much light left. I just figured that if light went low, I'd just turn around and head home. There were no chances of getting lost. The woods immediately engulf us. They are pretty dense, but it's normal. Not even 15 minutes of walking and I'm paralyzed with this overwhelming sense of dread. The woods are completely silent. My skin crawls just thinking about it. Even my dog stops and becomes anxious. I couldn't understand what was scaring me so much in the sudden silence. I couldn't move a muscle. I've read The Gift of Fear, and the only time I didn't listen to my guts, I lost my spleen in an accident. So wide-eyed and hyper-alert, I forced myself to move and noped out of there. It was like my brain was screaming, 
If you stay here, you'll die. Walking back, I couldn't stop the urge to continuously look behind me. At some point, I was practically running, and I kept thinking that if I sprained an ankle, I would die. The dog seemed relieved when we had turned back, and he kept looking behind too. When we finally made it out of the woods and back to the road, I felt a wave of relief and ran all the way back home with the adrenaline that I had. To this day, I don't know what happened, but I haven't gone back. So this isn't something that I've witnessed. I was told this story by one of the men who allegedly saw it. For context, this guy had run with some questionable crowds and did what jobs he had to to make money at times, if you get my drift. This guy has lots of stories. I mostly consider this a tall tale, but there is still enough of it that makes me wonder, what if? According to Zed, he had been finishing up some work down in Louisiana back in the late 1990s with his buddy and had a few days to kill, namely to get some fishing and hunting in, albeit out of season. One of the guys they had worked with gave them directions to a spot way back in the swamps and marshes that they could use without risking being caught by fish and game agents. He said one of the best things about this spot was there were, oddly enough, never any alligators there. A bit of a red flag, that one. Anyways, one fine morning, they set out in their boat before the sun was up, navigating their way through the swamps. From what he described, this was a section that was close to the Mississippi border, routes used by smugglers to move various products across state lines. They finally arrived at the spot after a few hours and some detours, they turned off the motor on their boat and started fishing. The trees were just thick enough to prevent you from being seen from overhead, and they were essentially in a huge inlet that was somewhat sheltered from the rest of the bayou, and they had the start of solid land along the two sides of it. By solid land, that also meant you had to walk across 10 to 15 feet of muck that could suck your boots off before you got to solid ground. So according to Zed, the day was progressing and fishing wasn't going great, but they still had beer, so they weren't inclined to go anywhere. They both noted that, as the guy had said, there were no alligators. Normally you could spot them lurking around or sunning themselves, but they were just utterly gone from the spot, as were most of the big fish it seemed. It was at this point they observed a herd of feral hogs emerge from the undergrowth on one side of the lagoon and make their way to the muck that was described before. They then commenced to start rolling and rooting in it to their heart's content. Zed and his buddy slowly angled their boat closer as they had sidearms with them and certainly had no issue with getting wild pork instead of fish if the opportunity was there. The hogs were leery, but not afraid, keeping the humans in their line of sight as they frolicked. Zed saw they had no real way to get to a hog if they shot it there, so they just floated along and watched for a good opportunity. But instead, they saw something else entirely. According to Zed, that's when they saw the mud start to move. He knew instantly it wasn't an alligator as an alligator would be flailing around in the mud, trying to reach the hogs. And whatever this thing was, it was covered in mud. The only way he could describe it was something was pushing its way through the muck, like an almost submerged bulldozer, creeping up on the pigs. They watched as it slowly approached a cluster of hogs who had noticed the movement, but seemed more curious about what it was than afraid. One of them, a pig that Zed estimated was between 150 to 175 pounds, was the furthest out in the muck, and made the mistake of attempting to sniff at whatever the intruder was. Zed said that quicker than they could react, something lunged out from the thing, 
and attached to the pig's head and face. As the pig thrashed, then tried to jump back, letting out the most blood-curdling scream they'd ever heard, the thing was hauled partially out of the muck and came into better view. Zed realized it was an alligator snapping turtle of proportions he'd never heard of. He's seen the one they keep at Bass Pro Shop that got big enough that it cracked its tank and had to get a new one, and he said that was like comparing a chihuahua to a pit bull. It was still partially obscured by the muck that was covering it, but Zed swore its shell had to be at least the size of the hood from a Volkswagen Beetle. His best guess on its weight was it was well over 500 pounds, and it was now backing up into deeper water, dragging the pig with it. Zed said from what they could see, the turtle's head was so big that it was able to fit its jaws partially around the pig's skull, and its beak was now essentially acting as a meat hook. Apparently it was about a 30 second fight to drag the pig out into the lagoon, but Zed said it was clear the pig never had a chance. The turtle dragged it out into the water, and the pig made one last desperate attempt to break free. Apparently hearing something screaming underwater one last time is as unnerving as you'd imagine, and Hollywood doesn't get the sound right. It then just went absolutely quiet after that. According to Zed, he and his buddy sat there for a minute, processing what they just seen, and except for the froth on top of the water and the stirred up mud, there was no sign anything had just happened. The other hogs had fled as soon as their comrade was attacked, and except for some bugs, it was almost completely silent. They couldn't say why, but Zed said they booked it out of there that something was off, and it felt wrong to be there. It wasn't like they could go to fish and game and describe what they saw, but they did fill in their acquaintances on why there were no alligators in that area. As far as Zed knew, nobody else had ever seen this colossal turtle and came forward to talk about it, but Zed said that it was big enough that if it caught a person unaware, it could easily overpower and kill a human the same way it did to that pig. Again, this is how the story was told to me. It's not my story, and I'm inclined to mostly believe it's a tall tale or an exaggerated one, but it does highlight that you don't need something as fanciful as a skunk ape or Bigfoot to be nervous about what might be lurking out of sight. This just happened about 15 minutes ago, and it's one of the weirdest encounters that I've ever had. My family and I were sitting in our living room, watching TV after dinner. All of a sudden, there's an unexpected knock at the front door. I go to open it, and there are three young teens, sophomores in high school, that I don't know. They tell me that a few guys are following them, and they needed to look like they knew someone. I told them immediately to come inside to evade the people following them. The teens told me it was three younger boys, probably 8th grade, that had been following them as they walked about a mile from a gas station nearby to my neighborhood. I went outside to try and see if I could see the boys, and sure enough, they were just down the street. When I stepped outside, they yelled, Lacey, is that you? I didn't answer. But I went inside and asked if any of the girls seeking refuge were named Lacey. None were. My dad then went outside to tell the boys to move along, and they got really mouthy and rude. Eventually, they went up the street and out of sight. However, they came back down a few minutes later, so I opened the door and yelled for them to leave, but they argued with me and wouldn't go anywhere. My dad went back outside, and a neighbor heard the yelling and came to see what was happening. 
with the threat of two grown men, the boys finally left. Not without some lip, though. I then drove the three teens back to one of their houses so they could evade the boys and get back home safely. Something was really weird about the interactions with the young boys. I don't know what they were looking to do, or if they were just looking for trouble, but something just didn't sit right with me. I'm just glad the three teens felt my house was a safe place to go. I don't know what it was, but it scared the fuck out of me. Basically, I was an 18-year-old who smoked weed in my car because my parents were strict as fuck. I had smoked for years, so I knew what the effects were. And yes, smoking and driving is bad, but you tell that to an 18-year-old. Anyway, I went to a local spot which was near my house in suburbia, but up a really long hill. It was a lookout on a hill in a remote area. The only way you'd get there is by car. It was the best place to smoke because it was remote. Anyway, I get there and there are no cars. It's late at night and dark. I put on some music and set up my bong. I smoked a few bowls and sat the bong down in my center console and I texted a friend saying that I would meet him in an hour to hang out. I sat there looking into the darkness and you could see the sky as well from where I was sitting. It seemed very peaceful all alone. Next thing I know, I hear a stick crack about three meters from my car, like someone had stepped on it. I flicked my lights on so I could see, and there was nothing. I freaked out a bit, but I eventually calmed down and took another hit. Just as I went to pack another bowl, I heard another stick crack but this time it sounded closer. I flicked the lights on again, but there was nothing. That's when I looked towards the night sky, and I see a human-looking silhouette stand up. It was unmistakable. Someone or something had been watching me for the past 30 minutes. I started the car, slammed it into reverse, and noped out of there. As I went down the hill, I remember the bong sitting there, I needed to pack it away, but it was loaded. I stopped at the start of a fire trail. I figured why waste good weed and went to finish what I'd packed. And just as I lit it up, I heard the gate behind my car rattle. Then I heard a noise on the back of my car. Again I noped out of there as fast as I could, packing the bong up as I sped down this hill. I got to my friend's house and told him what had happened. My theory now is that some kids did walk up that hill at night, saw me pull in, and watched me smoke for 30 minutes, then maybe decided to approach me. The sound at the gate was probably a possum. Either way, it haunts me to this day. It started with my three-year-old son having a seizure. Something told me to get up in the middle of the night to check on him. He was having a full-blown grand mal seizure. Up to this point, he was in perfect health. Needless to say, I freaked out. After a visit to a naval hospital in Jacksonville, Florida, my husband was a Marine. I was told he needed to be seen at an MRI clinic in Gainesville, Florida. We had just moved to Florida a few months prior, and I didn't know a soul. I was terrified about the upcoming appointments, as it was scheduled for 7.30am, and I had absolutely no idea how to get there. I told the NAS doctor about my fear, and his advice was to buy a map. There were no cell phones or GPS back then. So I pack up my two sons and head out at 3.30am. I planned to stop at a gas station and either buy a map or ask someone if they knew the way to the Naval Hospital Gainesville MRI clinic. It's about 4.15am at this point, and I'm white-knuckling it on a dark road to Gainesville. I'm in the right lane, 
when suddenly a car is to the left of me. The passenger window is down, and an elderly male is motioning me to roll down my window. The interior to the car is lit, and I notice he's looking at something like a metal notepad. It was weird. He then states, You're going to the MRI clinic. Follow me, please. At this point, I'm thinking he's going to lead me down a deserted road and do God knows what to me. We had stopped at two red lights. I wanted to ask him how he knew where I was going. He didn't ask. He knew. But I was too frightened to get out of the car. So I follow him. About 30 minutes later, he came to a stop and pointed to the building. He led me right to it. I looked at the building and then back towards the car. I wanted to get out and thank this kind stranger. Only there was no one there. No car. No taillights from a distant car. Nothing. I can remember this like it was yesterday. I'm not religious, but the only thing that makes sense about this was that it was a guardian angel. My son was diagnosed with a type of epilepsy which he outgrew in his teens. I did ask the doctor in Jacksonville if he sent someone to help me. He just left. Back when I was 16, I was walking in a heavily wooded area near St. Louis, Missouri, a largely undeveloped plot of land that was known for a large population of deer. The snow and ice had been unusually heavy that winter, so as April came around, it continued to thaw and rain a lot. Very dreary, overcast day, lots of fallen trees and mud. I noticed one tree had fallen in the middle of the path and I didn't focus on it too much, until I saw something dangling inches from my face. It was a dead deer, a young buck hanging from the fallen tree in between the two main branches. The hooves had been dangling inches from my face because of how zoned out I was, not processing anything because of the sense of security I felt in those woods. This was private property owned by the school I was attending, and hunting was strictly prohibited because there were neighbors nearby. More importantly, who walked hundreds of miles into the woods and hung up the carcass in that way in the middle of a rainstorm? School sent its security out. They figured it was illegal bow hunting, but the deer was never recovered. So at first, they didn't believe my story until weeks later, when several female deer were found laying in a nearby open field, all sprawled out in bizarre poses, clearly manipulated after they died. No signs of post-mortem cuts, scavenging from coyotes, or decay. They were also too far away from the road to be roadkill, but there could have been an attempt by someone to hide that they were hunting without license or permission. It's still very strange, and I haven't seen anything like it since, and I live in Florida, where weird stuff happens all the time in national parks and wetlands. One weekend, I was coming back home to my dorm after spending the weekend at my dad's house when I remembered I didn't have milk. So I decided to stop at this little gas station next to campus. The second I walked inside, my spidey sense tingled. There was a man, probably in his fifties, who locked on me immediately, as in completely unbashedly stared at me from the moment I walked in. I swear... It could only have been creepier if he'd licked his lips, but I saw he was in line to check out, so I figured I'd duck into the ladies' room and he'd be gone by the time I was out. No. When I came out of the restroom, he'd gone out of line and was stalking around the aisles, still watching me as he walked back up to the checkout. I got my milk and was a couple people behind him in line, trying not to freak out. 
Then, when he checked out, he took his bag, walked out, and stood next to the exit door, still watching me. Thank God for the clerk who noticed what was going on and said, Do you want to stay in here for a while? I'm sure I was shaking like a leaf when I nodded, but fortunately there was no one behind me. So the clerk let me stay there and chat until the guy finally got into his truck and drove off. That was almost 15 years ago, but to this day, I believe that guy meant me harm. I've never been so freaked out in my life. Many years ago, a friend and I decided to visit our mutual friend at her university and spend the weekend with her. We had extremely detailed directions to follow, and we were told the trip should take about three hours. While nothing went wrong on our drive, it seemed to take forever. I don't remember exactly at what point the woods started, but I do remember traveling through these woods for a long time, perhaps an hour. We were already well past the three-hour time frame my friend had given us by the time we left the woods. When we finally reached my friend's college town, it was nearly four and a half hours since we left. We didn't get lost. We never hit traffic or stopped for more than a few minutes, but we quickly forgot about it since we were happy to spend the weekend with our friend. When the trip back was a little over three hours, we thought it was weird but didn't think much of it at the time. It wasn't until my next trip to visit that I realized something had been strange. I spent that whole next trip waiting for the long path through the woods that we'd been on the first time, but they never appeared. Following the same directions as the first time, the entire trip took me about three hours, as did every other trip I made out there in the following years. I don't know what happened, and I've never been able to replicate it. I still wonder what happened, and where we really were when passing through those woods. I'd met a guy who had been traveling Australia with a couple of friends hitchhiking around as many of us had done. One of his friends told him they were near his distant uncle's house, whom he'd never met before. He got a phone number from a family member, and as they'd hoped, the uncle offered them a place to stay. He picked them up in town and drove them out to his rural property way out in the bush. They said he seemed like a pretty normal guy, friendly and cheery. When it was time to set up a place to sleep, the uncle took them to a closet that was totally full of sleeping bags and bedrolls. They didn't think much of it at the time, and all grabbed a kit and set up on the living room floor. They stayed a couple of days, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. And afterwards, the uncle drove them to the bus station, and they continued on their way. About a year later, that man was arrested and charged with several counts of murder. He was the man who was picking up young hitchhiking backpackers and slaughtering them. The guy who told me this story was 100% certain that he'd slept in the sleeping bag of one of his victims. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email, or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, 
Legends CBZ 69 2012 Katrina King Hospital Cakewalk Dirty Diana Quinta Siegel Shirley Porch Taylor Ruist Annalisa Petrie Jasmine Davis Janelle Jensen Jasper Roth Alex Monica Levelace James Gargano Sarah P Fire 05 Matt is a felter Tierra Sanders Melissa Kingery Kitty Cat Luna 2 Chelsea Moffat Ryan Gabrielle Jenny Sarah Zep Tepe Sarah C Sam Amanda Jane Vampy Debs October Gypsy Rebecca Erica B Maribel De Luna Lloyd Rash Jennifer Jenkins Kelly Townsend Mary Wright Tara Harris Elizabeth Knapp Eddie Sean Gorman Sue Gordon Spider's Web Kay Christy Absinthe Alice Dina Kingery Snowball Rathena Lady Drackard Brenda Pretty Girl 215 Amber Davis Sigma Cube X Leticia Acklin Ali O'Neill Gina Eberhardt Lilypad Ashley Nicole Sarah Chifalo May 2nd, 2003 Bella Plays, 2006 Skin Crawler Stephanie McLaren Borderline Betty Kuro Top Op Kelly Ann Bain Michael O'Malley Neil Kavanagh The Dead Movie Society Diana Johnston Taya Adwell Danielle Possum Posse Crafty Kell Brooke Scott McKenzie Megan Abrams Jane Wiggins Jasmine Davis Jack White Your Pappy's Dilly Emma Lisa Tanya Ferguson The Wendy Ember Hops Alexia Tuttle Ram Beltran Elizabeth Mayers Unladylike 13 Pegasus Genesis Sheila Grant 44 Sona Scout Mom 405 Cheryl Duckworth Ashley Bray Angela Reeves Kim Thompson Brock Bollard Nick Bigdowski Jessica Lasley Yennefer Clarice Scott Timothy Stratton Melissa Kingery Shane Stevens Serge Vargas Bart in Real Life April Jordanet Lisa Prentice Mason Hayes Sarah Price Jasmine Thomas Angie Lindon Z Harris Kirby Harris Yolo Sapien Lavina Cordelia Misty Racour Michelle Green Dixie Busby Paula Ferreira Nieves Samantha Place Donna Cox Stephen Wheeler Melissa Moore Deshaun Edmondson This Bad Kitty Gloria Christina Myway Connie Sue Carol Zaffirano Merciful Humming Kelsa Rundle Ashley Juster Vicky Howell Joe Tozer Zoe D Nicholas Johnson Kimmy Love Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.